In 1916, Albert Einstein proposed that spacetime formed a structure that could curve in the presence of massive bodies such as planets or stars. In 2004, almost 100 years later, this group of spheres was sent 650 kilometers above the Earth's poles inside a probe, with the objective of demonstrating this theory in an orbital laboratory free of interference. Although the probe obtained positive results, its journey was not without setbacks, so prepare your brain cells, because we are about to embark on a story that, although it began as a relatively simple idea, required almost 50 years of development, the joint work of more than 100 scientists, doctoral students and engineers, and cost $750 million. This is the story of Gravity Probe B and how it managed to measure the curvature of spacetime generated by our own planet's gravity. The theory of relativity is a great physical formulation that seeks to explain the behavior of the different physical factors that make up our reality from two points of view. The special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity. The first one disregards the effects of gravity, being understood as an extension of the Newtonian mechanics that most people know, but proposing two new postulates, the principle of relativity and the invariance of the speed of light. On the other hand, the general theory of relativity seeks to explain how gravity interacts with the different physical factors present in reality, describing a relationship between gravity and the geometric deformation of space-time. Despite the transcendental nature of the general theory of relativity, which has set the precedence in modern physics, it has been Einstein's least tested theory, because, as Kip Thorne, Nobel laureate in physics and producer of the movie Interstellar, said, in the realm of black holes and the universe, the language of general relativity is spoken, and it is spoken loudly. But in our tiny solar system, the effects of general relativity are but whispers. In other words, on the scale we are on, the effects of gravity on space-time are so small that it is extremely difficult to prove that they are even there. On the one hand, if we focus on large-scale demonstrations, in other words, at the galactic level, when two galaxies are aligned with respect to an observer, the gravity generated by the nearest galaxy distorts the space-time around it, acting as a gravitational lens, to the point of allowing us to visualize the galaxy behind it in the form of a ring. In fact, it is precisely because this phenomenon demonstrates the theory of relativity that they are called Einstein's rings. On the other hand, if we focus on the effects of gravity in space-time at a low scale, such as at the level of our own solar system. During the last 90 years there have been multiple tests to prove this theory with results that suggest that Einstein was on the right track. However, the problem with all these measurements is that the signals were extracted from systems with significant background noise, and therefore their results could not be considered conclusive. In order to get rid of any kind of interference in the measurements and to obtain once and for all the confirmation that gravity was capable of curving space-time even at the smallest scales, in 1959 the gravity probe space mission was proposed. Its objective was to verify two effects derived from the theory of general relativity. The geodesic effect and frame dragging. First, the geodesic effect predicts that a massive body and its corresponding gravity will generate a curvature in space-time. One way to visualize this phenomenon is to imagine space-time as an elastic material, which in the absence of gravity remains perfectly flat. But when affected by the gravity of a massive body such as our own planet or a star, it is curved. And this curvature of space-time is responsible for objects such as the moon orbiting around the planet Earth, and these in turn orbit around the sun. On the other hand, frame dragging, which was postulated by the Austrian physicists Joseph Lentz and Hans Thuring two years after the publication of the General Theory of Relativity, states that, in addition to the deformation of space-time generated by the massive body itself, this body is also dragged when the object is rotating. Understanding this, we can finally talk about the details of the mission and how exactly it was expected to demonstrate that such effects existed in reality. The principle of the experiment is based on the conservation of angular momentum, which as we saw in the video on gyroscopes, 
tells us that an object in rotation has an angular momentum represented by a vector in the direction of its axis of rotation, and that in turn this angular momentum will remain constant if there are no forces that generate a torque on the rotating object. It is a phenomenon that we can see in common objects such as a spinning top, which is able to maintain a vertical position while rotating, but becomes unstable once it loses speed and its angular momentum decreases. So, in theory, if we were to spin an object like this sphere, eliminate any torque or interference that might affect its angular momentum, and then orbit it around the planet Earth, we could measure the curvature of space-time. How, exactly? If we were to orbit this disk around the Earth and ignore everything we have discussed so far about the theory of relativity, what would happen is that the angular momentum should always point in exactly the same direction. However, if the theory of relativity is applicable to our scale, and the gravity of our planet is capable of bending spacetime, then, from our perspective, the angular momentum would be modified, because from the perspective of the sphere, it would have traveled a shorter distance. I know, surely at this moment your brain cells are exploding. Using an example that Kip Thorne himself presented in a conference related to the gravity probe, one way to visualize the expected results of this experiment is to plot the direction of the gyroscope on a plane, which represents spacetime without being curved and therefore will always point in the same direction. In this way, when considering that our planet curves the spacetime around it, this same paper becomes something similar to a cone, which means we should cut a small part of it and join its ends, with which the distance traveled by the gyroscope becomes slightly smaller than if there were no gravity, generating internal lag in the direction of the gyroscope. An important detail of the mission, as I mentioned previously, is that it was intended to measure the geodesic effect and frame dragging, each of which would curve space-time in a different way, making it difficult to differentiate which part of the gyroscope deflection would correspond to each of them. Fortunately, the solution was quite simple and clever. The way to separate the effects was to make the gyroscopes follow a polar orbit, that is, a trajectory perpendicular to the Earth's rotation axis. Thus, when analyzing the displacement of the gyroscope direction with respect to the original direction, the deformation generated by frame dragging would relate only to the displacement orthogonal to the orbital plane of the satellite, while the deformation generated by the geodesic effect would relate only to the displacement parallel to the orbital plane of the satellite. In this last part, the original direction of the gyroscope to be used as a reference is of great relevance, because without it we cannot measure the displacement. However, maintaining a reference point in an experiment that is trying to demonstrate the distortion of space-time is not something common. To solve this, a telescope was integrated to point at a distant star, M. Pegasi, using it as a guide to maintain a stable orientation of the probe during the entire mission, that is, approximately 16 months, a period during which it would make more than 6,000 orbits around the Earth. At this point, knowing what you want to measure and how to measure it is only half the job, since all the theoretical calculations and planning are of little use if the instruments are not accurate enough. All these experiments mentioned above were under the assumption that the gyroscope to be used would not be affected by any kind of torque or interference that could change its angular momentum, ensuring that any change in its direction corresponds only to the effects of gravity. Obviously, this would only be possible in theory, but that didn't stop the developers of this project from doing their best to get closer to that goal. At the beginning of the video I mentioned that the gravity probe's gyroscope was the most accurate man-made gyroscope at the time of the mission, but how accurate exactly? The accuracy of a gyroscope actually refers to the stability of its angular momentum and is measured by a rate of deflection, meaning how many degrees of angular variation you have in a certain period of time. To give you an idea of the level of perfection of the gravity probe B gyroscopes, their rate of deflection was more than 10 orders of magnitude less than that of the best laser gyroscope available at the time. This means a rate of deflection 10 million times less. It may seem exaggerated, but it was absolutely necessary to reach those levels of perfection to even be able to detect geodesic and frame dragging effects.
The way this absurdly high level of accuracy was achieved was by using these ping pong ball sized quartz spheres, with a little help from other systems, but let's take it one step at a time. If we focus on the spheres, the decision to use quartz was mainly due to the fact that it is an extremely stable material over time, both chemically and structurally, thus eliminating possible variations due to its degradation during the development of the experiment. The quartz was then melted, machined and polished to have the shape of a perfect and homogeneous sphere, having its center of mass exactly at the same point as its geometric center, eliminating possible vibrations that could affect the measurements or other systems used during the experiment, because as history has taught us, a system rotating at high speeds with an imbalance in its center of mass can have catastrophic results. This quartz sphere was coated with a thin layer of niobium, a material that at low temperatures becomes a superconductor, being vital for the operation of the system due to two reasons that I will explain in a few moments. Each of these spheres was covered by two pieces of quartz made with similar levels of precision, achieving that the space between these pieces was only 31 micrometers. This housing, in turn, integrated three systems. The first of these was the electrostatic suspension system, whose objective was to avoid any type of contact between the sphere and the housing, making it levitate in the center, thus eliminating possible friction that could affect the angular momentum. This system consisted of three pairs of electrodes located around the sphere, each of which was responsible for measuring and controlling the position of the sphere inside the housing cavity on a certain axis. This process was carried out at a frequency of 37,000 times per second and was possible because the niobium provided a layer of conductive material that could be affected by these electrodes. The second system integrated in this compartment was in charge of rotating the sphere up to a frequency of 80 revolutions per second at the beginning of the experiment to generate the angular momentum of which we have spoken so much. This was composed of two ducts, one through which pressurized gas entered the small space available between the spheres and the housing, making them rotate, and another through which the gas was extracted. Once the desired velocity had been reached, this same duct was used to extract the remaining gas particles, generating a vacuum in the housing, eliminating another factor that could affect the initial angular momentum of the spheres. The third system integrated in the housing is the angular momentum measurement system, which worked thanks to a property of superconductors, in which a rotating sphere of this material spontaneously generates a magnetic field that is perfectly aligned with its axis of rotation and whose intensity is directly related to the rotational speed. Thus, by measuring this magnetic field it was possible to calculate the angular momentum of the sphere. For this purpose, the housing cavity integrated a circuit of conductive material that surrounded the spheres and that was connected to a superconducting quantum interference device, or simply squid, which fulfilled precisely that function while applying diverse measures to reduce interferences in the results. These gyroscopes were also immersed in a gigantic tank of liquid helium to isolate the systems from external influences and keep the niobium at temperatures low enough to maintain its superconducting state. And as if all the measurements mentioned so far were not enough, the Gravity Probe B included four gyroscopes exactly the same, this in order to have a redundancy in the measurements and thus be able to detect anomalies that could occur, a very wise decision, because that is exactly what happened. The gyroscopes were affected by multiple unforeseen events, the most notable being one that caused the spheres to occasionally have random changes in their orientation, forcing the scientists in charge of the project to extend the mission to take extra data on what was causing these problems, in addition to requiring years of analysis to ensure that the calculations made considered all the variables of the experiment. Having launched the Gravity Probe B in 2004, the final results were only presented in 2011. Of the four integrated gyroscopes, the second one was the most affected by the previously mentioned phenomena, causing greater uncertainty in the results and reducing the reliability of the experiment, especially for the analysis of the deformation generated by the frame dragging, whose expected variation was much smaller than that of the geodetic effect. Anyway, how do the results compare with what is predicted by the theory of relativity? As we can see in this table, the experimental results are quite close to the theoretical predictions, 
demonstrating that the effects of gravity in space-time can also be detected at relatively small scales such as the vicinity of our own planet, and thus improving the understanding of the rules that govern our reality. While this story seems to end with a happy ending, the truth is that it also has a sad side. Since this experiment was first proposed in 1959 and the development lasted more than 40 years, in that time other experiments were proposed with the same objective, taking advantage of the new technologies available and analyzing the problem with new eyes. More specifically, the Laser Geodynamic Satellite Project LAGEOS, launched two missions, one in 1976 and one in 1992, with the objective of performing multiple experiments on the orbit of the planet Earth, including one in 2004 that aimed to measure frame dragging. The project successfully performed the experiments, achieving much higher accuracies than those of Gravity Probe B. In fact, these satellites are still active performing various experiments to this day. So, all the work done and the millions of dollars invested were pointless? Well, I wouldn't say that. Analyzing the same phenomenon using two different methods can be equally or even more valuable than demonstrating a single phenomenon with high precision. Moreover, when a mission is developed on this scale, the benefits are not limited to the results of the experiment. All the technologies developed to meet the requirements, as well as the theoretical models and data analysis tools, become available for use in future missions, accelerating their development or even opening the door to the analysis of other previously unthought of challenges. For example, the definition of the kilogram as a unit of measurement is currently based on the realization of a perfect sphere of silicon whose precision is such that it is possible to estimate the number of atoms that compose it. In this way, by having an object of known dimensions and atomic composition, the unit of weight can be defined, eliminating other factors such as the possible variation of its composition over time, a problem that existed in the old definition of the kilogram. In this way, two problems from totally different areas could be solved using similar technologies, so even if your plans do not turn out as expected, remember that what you learn along the way also has value. I got philosophical already, so let's leave the video until here. This was a very different video from what I usually do and it would have been impossible to finish it in just one month of work if it wasn't for the help of the new members of our team that is growing little by little. If you liked this video, technology and 3D animation as a means to convey information, I remind you that you can support us on Patreon to make more and better animations, plus get early access, access to some of the 3D models I use in the animations and your name at the end of each video. That's all for now and see you in the next video.